five, four, three, two, one. Hi, folks. Uh, welcome to the Thursday edition of the I Write Radio podcast videocast. We'll go with a stalwart, I think, first today, which is Nicola Sturgeon's press conference. We don't have to watch the uh, Downing Street one anymore because it doesn't exist. Um, Stuart has been reading Peter Bell on Joanna Cherry. We'll get a chat about that. And Jimmy has a tinfoil hat issue um, that he wants to bring to our attention uh, about data mining. So the press conference today, um, I said to the boys earlier that I thought Nicola Sturgeon should simply get up at the start of questioning and say, are you all stupid? We don't, we are unable to predict the future, therefore plans may have to change. Please take that on board and stop acting like a bunch of wains. I don't know how you feel about that summing up, chaps, Stuart? Uh, yes, you're probably right. Um, she started treating uh, the journalists with the respect they deserve, um, which is not a lot. <laughs> and she scalped two or three of them. She's very good at that. Um, today, what did she come up with? She was um, she was talking about a few things that she, she wanted. A tourism recovery group. She, made, she said that was a new thing, and I thought, ooh. And who's in charge? Fergus Ewing, not my favourite MSP. He, can, can he go wrong? Probably. Um, <laughs> but she did talk, I mean, let, let's one or two quotes. Here's a really good one. She said, I've talked about the virus. Um, if I could, I'd give the virus a, a give it a stern talking to, but I can't. I mean, can you imagine doing that hairdryer thing down the phone? Possibly she, she does talk like that to people that she does not that don't do what they're dealt. She's obviously a, a very stern matron. And she was asked about um, August the 11th. <laughs> Is she obviously a very stern matron? I think so. There's no question of it. I think we're, it we're... sounds to me like she certainly is in Stuart's dreams, Nori. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's coming across as, uh, I'd never seen it before, but yeah, okay, we'll leave it at that. I'm going to say no. Or, uh, yeah, no. Uh, she, uh, also, she also gave uh, the, the guy, Peter McMahon, who she... I always thought she was always a bit soft on. Uh, she gave him a telling off. She was um, talking about journalists. Only a week ago, you'd have asked why I, uh, why I was uh, one way at this one. I took one why position. I didn't have a contingency plan. Uh, and then the, uh, yeah, well, yeah, basically, you, you can carry on with that. Jimmy? Yeah, I, I, I thought it was a bit, all a bit sedate today, mate. Um, like you say, it's entertaining in terms of getting a giggle at media. But other than that, the the information that you get at the start of the presser is far more valid and important than anything that is elicited by the questioning of the science of the Scottish media. Um, there's stuff on education, schools and that. I give it a rest. They've got seven weeks. We've got numbers of new cases looking outstanding in this country at the moment. What was it the first time since 11th of March that we've had two days in a row where they've been in single figures? Mm. And there's nothing positive comes out of the media. They, they, they've no congratulations for actually anything that's done. They just want to pick holes and desperately try and do the opposition's job for them because the opposition can't do their job. I think I'll, I'm going to have a stab at summing up media questioning as I did for the First Minister's answers. And their questions are really, please, 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 please give us some information that we can beat you up with later. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for a date. They're looking for a, a, a solid plan. Uh, a hard that, target that we miss. Yeah, that we can beat you up on because, you know, um, something changed and you had to change the plan, which okay. is essentially what they're trying to do by calling the opening of the schools in August a U-turn. Oh, well, okay, but that's fair enough. But, but come on, you've got to feel a wee bit sorry for them now. I mean, uh, over the last few weeks, we've watched them. Well, all three of us have been watching these 
daily press briefings, and we've we've learned an awful lot about the press in Scotland, more about the press in Scotland than we've ever seen before. They've been revealed as a bunch of diddies. Mm. And don't forget, they've got deadlines to meet, and they've got to write so many thousand words, so that otherwise they didn't get paid. Well, their, their big problem is they're fighting competence. <laughs> That's their problem. Very good. Yes, yes I like that. Uh, it's great fun in Westminster because they've got a totally incompetent government on all levels. I mean, they must be tearing their hair out trying to decide what story to print in, uh, about Westminster. Those that are prepared to print negative stories about the government anyway. But in Scotland, you know, I mean, she's being honest. She's saying, look, some things I don't know. So we've got a contingency plan and we've got a plan and basically, those two have shifted round because circumstances have changed. Look, I've got to give the, the chief nursing officer a wee shout because she's never that impressive. But she did basically she said what she said today: avoid contact to avoid a contact tracer calling you. In other words, that's a good reason just to avoid people. That, okay, that it's a, it's a might bit, be the it's shift. It's a bit much government. though that what two, two three weeks into contact tracing, testing and tracing. The, the, the chief nursing officer has got to dumb it down that far for our media that she has to say avoid contact to avoid a contact tracer calling you. I, I mean, that is pretty dumbed down. I think that might be the new message. I think we might have heard it for the first time today. You don't want a contact to trace you. Don't get in contact with anybody. Yeah, well, that's a bit. I'm, 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 no. Have you seen the photographs this morning of well, Brighton uh, Beach, Bournemouth. The, the meadows, Bournemouth, oh, Bournemouth. lovely beach. Bournemouth. I, 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 I spent a the summer there. I, I, I washed dishes in the hotel overlooking that. I beach. thought he was going to start singing a song there. <laughs> <laughs> you, I spent you, a mucky summer in Bournemouth. Spice. We're <laughs> all going on a summer holiday. <laughs> we're uh, we're gonna ban ban you from going anywhere near stiletto heels after your comments on the First Minister. Uh, right, and right. any mention of Bournemouth, because my memory of the hotels in Bournemouth were they were all male affairs, if you get my drift. Mm. Yes, so that, that was my, one of my early, as a young person's experience of uh, that lifestyle when I went the there. The gay That's, community. It's quite strong there. Um, I, I'd like to mention Andy Whiteman simply because he got a name checked by the First Minister. For no good reason. Well, a good reason, I suppose. So he did, he did well. He he could turn up in the papers tomorrow. Well, that that was about um, what do you call it? Airbnb. Airbnb, because he's got to be in his bonnet about it. Yeah, I think it's made a bit trying to convince the Greens to bump him further up the list, just in case they lose votes next year. Because I think Andy Whiteman's about the one Green she'd actually quite like to be re-elected next year. That's an interesting point of view. I I find them a little bit shall we say, blinkered. You've on never liked him, admit it. His projects, I, I, I find him <laughs> quite arrogant. Nori, Nori I've, known, I've known you and me had to sit in another row of seats because Andy Whiteman was too. I, I, he, he bothers me. He, he, there is no grey areas for Andy, um, as far as I can see. I enjoyed his books. His books were very good and very informative. Aye, that's fair enough. His, the especially no the poor had no lawyers. Yeah. That Aye, was. I would recommend that to everybody to read. Unless you're rich. Yeah, mm. um, and it came true for him when he got taken to court. Yep, and we won that. To, thank goodness. He had to raise the money, um, crowdfunding, which I contributed to because, as I say. Um, I'm not particularly fond of the man, but uh, he's definitely got my respect. Uh, right, okay, Peter A. Bell, Stuart. I missed this piece this morning. Peter A. Bell, I'll let shortcut and assume that our viewers and listeners know the man and his position. His key mission at the moment is White Rose Rising, which is to develop a movement towards a good clear plan B at the moment, but which will become plan A, uh, to avoid any reference to a Section 30 permission, any permission at all from London for Scotland to make its decision on its uh, independent future. 
And today he was very pleased at Joanna Cherry's column, which I must admit I didn't read. I assume it was in yesterday's paper, was it? Anyway, he's... I don't know how we missed it. Was it in the National? I'm going to sum it up, simply saying, because without reading any quotes, that he's, 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 he's very pleased about that. He's still worried about... I suppose the, the, the issue this week is about will there, there's, there's been a proposed virtual SNP conference for the summer. Can they get a plan B onto the, oh, what do you call it? Agenda. Is it more than an agenda? Okay, but we'll call it an agenda for now. Uh, the conference agenda as a motion, as a, as a motion. One something that gets decided by the conference. There well, they're, they're looking to make it policy. Aye. Um, it seems highly unlikely at this stage, but that looks as though that that is the immediate campaign of the Plan B people and, is, and led by, at the moment, I would say, uh, Peter A. Bell. Yeah, so, I don't think, they, think they'll get anything anywhere near the conference. That, that policy is going to be decided by... Nicola Sturgeon and about half a dozen people close to her. And the last thing she wants is having even a hint of being mandated by the membership to put anything in the manifesto. We, we all three of us have experience of, um, shall we say, the floor um, at party conferences not being allowed to get onto the agenda what they want as a means to control the policy of the party. Mm -hmm. And the argument always made is that the, the sharp end of the party, in the case of the SNP, the government, needs the freedom to make and manipulate policy in order to succeed. Uh, we're talking, we're, it's the argument that's used at the Labour Party. It's the argument used... But what you're talking about is negoti the negotiations... Uh, I'd like to I'd like to pass that idea what you've just said on to Peter Curran, who is a professional negotiator. Now, no, I'm not really talking about negotiating. I'm talking about being tied to policy that's in the manifesto that is unrealistic in reality. That's what I'm saying. I mean, the enthusiasm from the the floor of any conference is rarely realistic. Well, anything that they bring forward is really going to be legal. Oh, it's do. really going to, be, or well, it's and you've got to, if, given that the SNP are in government, and given that ninety nine percent of the media are against them, if conference mandates them to have a policy of any kind, you're basically handing the media a stick to beat the government with. Long before they go to sit down to write the manifesto, the media are going to pick over it pick it to bits, find wee holes in it, and absolutely destroy it. And it's all going to be completely watered down when it comes to manifesto time anyway. So well, why bother going through all that to then second and triple guess what conference might actually have meant by whatever motions were passed and well, the come minute, up with something that's acceptable? The head, you, can, you can write the headlines now. If there's a plan B suggested, from the floor to go into the manifesto, we know what the headlines are going to say. I'll start with U turn, I'll start with um... UDI, is what mm -hmm. they're going to say. Well, what, what's the alternative? Do we all just give throw our hands in the air and lie down and get trampled on? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in a confident enough position to say there's an alternative. The question I think now becomes do you trust the hierarchy of the SNP to come up with? a method to get us a referendum. Um, I hate my doots, as they say. They've got, they're, mm -hmm. they're strong and running the country, and she's strong and running this virus <laughs> emergency. But as far as moving to... We've had 13 years since the first SNP government in 2007. And uh, one referendum. And one referendum. And we've done well there. We should have capitalised on that, but I'll leave it at that. Well, let, let me put it this way. 2014 was seven years after the SNP got into government. It is now coming up for seven years after the last yeah. referendum. It's time we had another decision. And they're well, faced with the strongest polls that they've ever seen. So and possi possibly the, uh, not electorally the weakest government England's ever had, but certainly intellectually and 
Um, what am I thinking of here? I don't think the UK government and this Prime Minister have the backing of the country to deny Scotland a choice in the way that any, even, even Theresa May had more backing from the country to deny that choice than Boris has got. All this stuff about England and Eng English people being so impressed with Nicola Sturgeon, all that is playing into our hands when she says, we want to make the choice and Boris says, no, but you're no going to. I, th I think this is the worst kind of government we could possibly have to ask for a section 30. That's a possible. I mean, you, you, you could be right, Nori, but you could also be wrong in the sense that they are so committed to their ideology. Their ideology obviously overrides every, every move they've made on this emergency. Uh, their ideology is forcing through a no deal, which we're not that surprised about, but it's been, we've only got another week, is it? Before the end of June, we're, we're, we're almost there on the decision to even just ask for a, an extension, which they've already No, no, said. they've already made the decision. They're, they're not already, asking. I know, they've happened. already said this, they're not going there. But you're left with the question, if it comes to their ideology of their independence from Europe and uh, their deal with America, if it rubs up against Scottish independence, either or, which will they go for? Right, we can't, sorry, we'd know the, sorry, we'd know the decision they're making. The problem is, do they have the backing of the country? Do they have the backing even of the media? I think you're We've both wrong. I think you're both totally wrong. Their ideology is another reason that they'll simply... Their idea of freedom is not freedom for anybody else but them. Mm -hmm. Freedom for them to operate yeah, yeah. without constraint. And saying no to Scotland, there's no hardship to them. Well, I know that as all. well, mate. But what I'm saying is Boris has very little respect. Brexit has less than the 50% of the country that it had. Brexit now is probably running... That opinion poll wouldn't matter because it's happening, but Brexit now is probably running at about 45%. Um, because it's going to be a no deal, it's going to drop to 40%. So basically we're going to be arguing with the extreme right wing of what's left of Boris's support. Um, I didn't think we even argue with them, I just think we tell them. I think we tell them, you know what, nah, your country's a basket case and we no longer want to be a part of it. We are setting aside the Act of Union, what are you going to do about it? Well... You see, I, I think all, all the arguments about freedom, if you like, is about how much they control. It, it, all they're interested in is being in the driving seat. They don't care who gets left at the bus stop. They don't care who's in the back seat of the car. That's not what interests them. And the so, lack of intellect is a disadvantage to us because they simply won't argue with the arguments. They you haven't actually, engaged. you haven't actually answered my challenge. My challenge was what if, right? What if it's a choice between allowing Scotland to have a, let's say, staying out of Scotland's decision to go for independence, perhaps not in a legal way, but a, a rational way that the rest of the world might accept, and their ideology, their Brexit ideology, which would they choose? How, how do we challenge their Brexit ideology? I mean, that, your it, argument but... doesn't stand up because there is no reason at all they have to pay any attention to anything well, look, we say. Look, look, just a moment. They've made a mess of the Northern Irish situation. They've completely screwed over the DUP. They could do the same with their um, unionists here in Scotland. It won't make any difference, Stuart. They don't need them. I mean, that's my point. For the next four and a half years, we have a dictatorship. The only time anything you're saying becomes relevant is before the next election. Right now, they don't have to do, say, they don't even have to pretend that they're listening. They've stopped pretending that they take the SNP seriously at Westminster. All right, so that's why you have to do something you know. that makes them... But that's why we have to do something. Other than asking for a section bloody theory. Well, that's um, my point, Jimmy. We, that's why, why some, something has to be done to waken up the SNP. Perhaps they're just sitting there 
you know, obviously she, the uh, first minister's having a good, she's having a good virus. She's not getting away from it. But we've still got to face the lethargy of this SNP government. Where else are lethargy. they? Where else are they going? Stuart, they're dealing with the biggest emergency since the Second World War. Well, fair enough, but we're lethargy. But one of the solutions could end up being their only sensible future is to break away from this terrible England. It's in ter and a terrible mess. Well, I mean, you're making a presumption there that they don't think breaking away is the only solution. I, I think what we're beginning to see now is the little inroads, the little things that will impact with the Scottish public, which is, please let us borrow £500 million more. No, you can't. SWAT, go away. We're not listening to you. That will impact. Uh, what was the other thing that they've asked about? Oh, if the furlough finishes, if there's a, pike, a spike in Scotland and the UK government is not willing to bankroll further furlough, that will impact. These are the small things that will make a bigger difference because well, for once, it'll actually be something the general public can see the decisions made at Westminster yeah. affecting their pockets. Yeah, they'll, they, they might see it. That will depend on the media, of course, because the media, the, the, the media well, we, in Scotland might not let them see the perspective that you're talking about. They might they see won't. the news, but they won't see it from They that. won't let them see it. I mean, we know that. There's no way they're going to say Westminster has just um, insulted the Scottish Parliament. Westminster has just refused furlough, thereby forcing the Scottish government to follow their path. Westminster has refused to up the borrowing powers of the Scottish Parliament, so the Scottish Parliament can't do anything to alleviate the problems. So what? what Unionist what, press are not going to talk in those terms. All right, but so what does it take? Something? Oh, I don't know. Something like George Soros comes in and decides to, to, to launch a pirate TV station that's uh, available all over Scotland. What? Oh, we're never going to get a bloody media. Why would you want for, George Soros okay. anywhere near there's it? There's no market. Stuart, there's no market for anybody to launch a Scottish TV station. We're a country of five and a half million, mate. The only time I think the Scottish TV station will be launched is when we launch it. Oh, no, it was a fairly extreme example. Okay, okay. We've kind of talked around the trees on that one. Right, Jimmy, where's your tinfoil hat? Right, tinfoil bonnets tightly on, people. I've got a bee in my bonnet the last week or so, just um, watching just quite how many very similar posts that look awfully, awfully much the same, coming for a very limited number of people, actually, when you have a look at it. I think it's a massive data mining operation that's going on. Um, they're asking questions around maybe a dozen Scottish Yes sites and Facebook pages and Twitter pages and what have you. Things like, should Nicola Sturgeon ask for more borrowing powers? Should Nicola close the border? And then you take a look at the, the replies. And given just how important data has been in the last few elections, I'm pretty much certain that we're looking at a concerted attempt to work out exactly what people will do in certain situations over the next year or two. Um, it's interesting that already our two strongest suits, shall we say, are under concerted attack. Electoral unity is under concerted attack, or we wouldn't have fucking two new independence parties ready to stand on the list in next year's election with another two ready to pop up. So we're probably going to have five options to vote for for independence in next year's election. I would say the, the more the merrier because if there's more, a lot of them, then it's easier just to say both SNP. Ah, you did. Ah, possibly, mate, possibly. The other thing that's un, under concerted attack is the marches. There's not a chance a unionist organisation in this country, and by country I mean the whole England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland as well. There's no chance a unionist organisation could get 100,000 people marching down the street all carrying a union jack. Wouldn't it happen? We can date in Scotland. So what happens? Suddenly we've got three organisations organising marches for next year. 
people are already organizing what they're calling virus compliant demonstrations next month. EUOB, ah. what are they even thinking about organizing summit for next month at Edinburgh? That's basically just so that Neil Mackay can beat Manny Singh and Yes Too and be the first person having a Yes event. It's ludicrous. Um, and that will never again get the, that picture of 100,000 people wrapped around Edinburgh Castle and marching down the Royal Mile because the marches are basically blown apart now. I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think specifically on the marches, I think all under one banner will continue to get good support. You think, given that he's going to sell a job and going to sell a job, they're, they're now wanting two paid organisers in that organisation. You I don't really think people think that that's okay? I don't think that's... Well, I don't think it's unreasonable. No, I don't think it's unreasonable. They've taken on... The, the, the amount of work, organisation work they've taken on has, has been an awful lot more. And, I, and the other you really thing... think it takes, it takes a massive thing to organise marches? Yeah, because what's going to happen is Labour-controlled, unionist-controlled councils are going to start throwing up barriers. They were doing Legal that last bar- year. Yeah, I know. And that's why full-time people could well be needed. And you think Neil Mackay is the man for that? Given I, don't, his past? I don't know. I think, you need, I think you need to employ a lawyer, um, at least one lawyer, and you need somebody, possibly an expert at stewarding. I do, I do think, and it's something I've said before, um, it's kind of where I disagree with Leslie Riddick. Um, she's looking for some structure for the Yes Movement. The Yes Movement was successful because it didn't have a structure. I think, the last well, time it, round. Well, in theory, it did have a structure. It was set up by SMP and what his place was uh, no, no. running. No, not the Yes Movement. No, well, Yes the, Campaign. The Yes Campaign, I know. But the different Yes Movement, thing. a different thing. And, of course, once uh, the further away we get from 2014, the more diverse it is. And I, and I do think there was a, a hell of a lot of good stuff from the grassroots came through that appealed to people purely and simply because it was grassroots. You know, the wish trees were a great idea. The artistic side of it, the art side of it was fantastic. Mm. And I, I don't think, I think we'll lose that spontaneity that dragged a lot of people in and gave a lot of joy and fun yeah. to the oh, whole yeah. thing. Oh, well, yeah, that's another thing. Well, look, it's worth, it's worth bringing back. My first dissertation was about the CND. And at the time, the CND had become refashionable again. Because what was happening was the Americans were bringing in their mobile ICBMs, nuclear missiles, uh, into Greenham Common in southern England, very close to London when you think about it. And uh, every morning they, they drove out into the countryside, 10 of these fucking lorries, so that they couldn't be found by the Russians. That completely electrified CND. Now, what could happen to the... What could electrify the Yes movement? Well, I think all you need to do is give a date for a referendum. I don't think you need to get more complicated than that. But but we've gone off subject. Have we? Do, well, we have in the sense that the opposition, if they're gearing up by mining data now, do we need to be doing the same sort of thing. Well, I think if you want to talk about the, uh, the opposition and uh, we've got to accept that what Jimmy's, not everything what Jimmy's talking about needs a tinfoil hat, but I'm going to join him. <laughs> uh, you've got to look at the Integrity Initiative and what they've been up to over the last few years. And they're even based in Scotland, but they, they are basically a Whitehall uh, Intelligence Services British Army Department. Where are they based? Forfara or is it somewhere stupid? Ochter Mochte. Is it Ochter Mochte? Uh, they're in Ochter Mochte, strangely enough, just in the road for possibly the most vocipor- vociferous yes hub of the ball in Cooper, the Crossgate Centre. Oh, well, maybe that's why and they're the Cent- And the Crossgate Centre have never had a single thing to say about the Integrity Initiative. They've never went down the road and chapped on the door and said, oh, you, what are you bunch of fannies all about? Well, there's a good way. Well, see, that, uh, I'm glad I picked on that one. 
I'm actually delighted to see you two on the same side for a change. <laughs> now, I, I gen generally, mate, there's, there's plenty of wee things going on. Stuart, you mentioned a few weeks ago about hands around Scotland and certain um, characters that were posting certain things here. It was deliberate, in my opinion. It was people being deliberately obtuse to gauge reactions, to check, because Hands Around Scotland's a pretty big yes group. You know, there's about 12,000 people follow that page daily on um, Facebook. So it's a great one to get in about and get some data. Um, you know yourself, that all the marches, there, as I say, there's three of them now. You can almost write off Manny Singh after his um, bullshit that he put on Twitter the, the other night about Alex Salmon, but there will be three organisations all organising marches. What's the it's, third one, Jimmy? Sorry, I'm not aware it's, of the it's, third it's, one. It's, it's come for the Yes 2 page, mate. They're now organising marches and meetings as well. Right, the Yes 2 group on Facebook are now, he's got one up for, in fact, they've all got a list of marches for next year, mate. Hence the reason I think EUOB jumped in and started organising. Well, wait a minute, is, it, is this the, the one in Dunfermline? Yes, too. Is that the fella? No, I mean, they've got a list. They've got a Bannockburn one. They've got Edinburgh, Glasgow, Perth, all the usual all suspects. Right. There's been a few new paid places like Coat Bridge added for some strange reason. but I don't, I, I mean, I would probably like to see an organisation that concentrated on the big cities and another one that concentrated on the wee tunes. Because mm -hmm. I well, do I think, think marching through Gala Shields or... Um, or hike or whatever is me. I think it'd be, I think we'd be better taking out, taking out of these folks' hands, mate. I think we'd be better having local matches and a couple of big ones a year. I think we'd be better trying to refire up everybody's yes hub, you know, like the yes hubs in the south side and all over the country. Get them fired up. Get all okay. local organisers to organise local matches and then come together two or three times a year in a big match because oh, the forties, the forties for the big ones are cracking. Now you're talking about, of course, organising a, a, a national organisation. I, I like. I went to the Gala Shields march. Do you know what it, it, what happened in Gala Shields? It was the, the the only thing comparable that they ever had once a year in Gala Shields was the Brawl Ads Day. Yeah, the right at. They the, the locals, the local businesses, they loved it. Absolutely adored it. There was you know there was eight thousand people there, all spending money. Yeah. Aye. And it was an occasion. And so, everybody was well behaved. And everybody was well behaved. Well, I, I just, as I say, I think it's, it's interesting that electoral unity has been targeted and the marches have been targeted because it wasn't difficult to split a party. You will be, uh, Manny Singh kind of done that on his own. But the fact that there's now a third organisation, it worries me slightly because, as I say, these marches were followed worldwide. You know, that photo of the crowd sneaking up around Edinburgh Castle and all the way down the mound and already into Holyrood Park, that was transmitted in America, Canada, Australia. Mm -hmm. That gave us wonderful optics when uh -huh. people... And, and there's nothing that the British government or the British media can do to stop that going around the world, pictures like that. Yeah. No, no, I, I do think you're right. And it, it would worry me... If the if we had two dates in Edinburgh, two dates in Glasgow, etc., for aye, the big that's... ones, it would worry me. I, I see the local ones as much more about influencing the undecided in these places. Well, that's, that's when you were when you and Stuart were just talking there about Gala Shields, mate. The borders is an area that we should be organising local marches in, and if you do have a great deal like that, and you can actually talk to people in the marches, and aye. you. Can, they, instead of them getting barked at, or instead of them having to listen to politicians, they're listening to the ordinary punters that maybe drove down for least to Gala Shields to march there. So why are you so independent? Just because I am. Just because we should be taking charge. It's a it's a face to face conversation that rather than being instructed or, as I say, barked at by a politician. Well, it, 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 it struck me as the atmosphere when we got there was amazing. And bearing in mind how the, the recent electoral history of uh, these constituencies supporting basically Tories and... Um, mm -hmm. the, Dems and Tories. And, and the least... Um, the, well, the least 
throw indie places in Scotland as well. Aye, and like you say, mate, it's a great day out. The businesses make a few quid, and you, the best thing about anything, the, the hand, hands of our parliament meetings, the marches, the best thing about any of it is just meeting up with people and having those conversations, because yeah. that's where you really change minds. It isn't leaflets. Aye, it isn't leaflets. It's normal folk talking to each other, standing standing having a pint or standing having a fag outside a boozer or whatever and just saying, well, I think you're wrong on that because of this. Aye. They're not being lectured. That they're, kind of they're, not, you're, they're getting it here. And let's be honest, they're getting to hear facts that don't get out to them, such as just how much money Scotland contributes to the UK exchequer that we never ever see a part of, for example. Because most people never knew that the UK government stopped um, producing a breakdown of revenues raised in each of the four parts of the UK in 1922 yeah. because it was so embarrassing that they'd already lost Ireland and they knew that they would lose Scotland if they kept producing that breakdown of figures. My folk didn't even know stuff like that. Um, anybody want a wee cheer up? Aye, go on, cheer me, make me smile and giggle like a lamb gambling towards the links with a bucket full of cider. I'm ready. Bucket full of cider, did I hear? This mm -hmm. is um, Americans arguing with their uh, politicians about having to wear, being forced to wear face masks. Ah. This makes you At a commissioner's meeting think in we're Florida's lucky to be British. Chicago, anger erupted after a unanimous vote to make masks mandatory. This turned downright ugly. Here, here was the scene. You literally cannot mandate somebody to wear a mask knowing that that mask is killing people. It literally is killing people. And my, the people, we the people, are waking up. And we know what citizen's arrest is. Because citizen's arrests are already happening. Okay, and every single one of you that are obeying the devil's laws are going to <laughs> for crimes against humanity. Oh, humanity today is ignorance, arrogance, and apathy. Keep taking the road of least resistance. Keep listening to the TV brainwashing you from birth. And they want to throw God's wonderful breathing system out the door. You're all turning your backs on it. Doctor, I really have many question marks about your degrees and what you really know. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I don't think that you are worthy of your credentials. And I would ask suggestively that you go back to school and get educated. <laughs> That's brilliant. I'd, I'd love to ask the bird at the end what she means by ask suggestively. Because you usually <laughs> have to pay an extra tenner for that, do the least. <laughs> Just, it was... It was the religious thing. You're doing yeah. the devil's work, making us wear our face mask. Oh. Turn, turning against God's beautiful breathing system. Try to explain in that to the 150,000 Americans that stopped breathing because God gave up on them and sent a virus. It's, it's, they can twist it, unfortunately. They, 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 I, I'll never forget the Blues Brothers. I love the Blues Brothers. And close to the start, when the pair of them go up the stairs to see the, the nun. Oh, yeah. Love it. Yeah. Love that movie. Let's be honest. I had a, a wonderful comparison about that the other day where somebody was talking about Jackson Carlo's performances in Parliament lately. Mere car crashes in the, than the Blues Brothers. Oh. There was a lot of cars got crashed in the making of that movie. Absolutely. And on that cheerful point, folks, I think we'll call it a day. Thanks, Stuart Lockhead. Thank you, Jimmy Hutton. I'm Norris Stewart. And thanks for listening, folks. Uh, and we'll catch you tomorrow. Cheers for now.